My name is Jerry Wright. I'm with Chadwick Washington. You can refer to me as Jerry or not Ken Chadwick or not Will Washington if you want to call me that. Um, as Anna said, I am from the, our Richmond office. I come up here quite often and, and visit with the Fairfax folks. Um, I will say this at the, at the outset as a caveat. I do intend to take questions at the end specific to documents that are involved with Reston. I'm, I'm not the one to ask. Uh, that would be Ken or Will, but I'm here to provide a legislative update. If you have any questions about the legislation, and I'm going to throw in a, probably almost a handful of cases to talk about as well that were uh, that will be applicable to you guys and also very interesting and hopefully make it entertaining. Um, as Anna said, I'm in intimately, that's a good word, intimately involved with the legislative process in, in Richmond. Every year, uh, we participate in what is called the Virginia Legislative Action Committee, which is the, uh, a political committee for CAI, which is Community Associations Institute. Um, we're active in dealing with uh, legislation uh, that, that comes through every year that deal with community associations. Um, each year, we are getting more and more well known with the courts and with the legislature. And I can tell you that's not necessarily a good thing. Especially but you've got, Sorrell. what's that? Especially with Scott Sorrell. Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> I'm gonna refrain. <laughs> I'm not casting aspersions, but yes, uh, and his, and his uh, recently former partner, uh, Jeff Peterson, who really don't like associations, and I've had to go up and, and testify in front of committees side by side with these guys, and it's, you know, I'll leave it at that. But what we do is, and we, we do have to, we do have to put heads with legislators and sometimes with other interest groups. Now, do we have any realtors in the, in the bunch here? Like real estate agents? Okay, good. No, I'm just kidding. We actually, in the recent years, have been, uh, we've been actually playing uh, pretty well with the realtors. But every year, the realtors, you're gonna find out that every year the realtors will have their hands in legislation that affects the community associations. And I'm gonna be talking about that in a bit. Now you've all heard the phrase, there ought to be a law, right? I can imagine that legislators hear that from their loan, loan, some of their loan constituents who are fed up with their association, they're mad at what their association is telling them to do with their property, and they say there ought to be a law. And I'm gonna tell you a story, this is actually, we, we figured that that's why bad legislation gets put forth and introduced in the General Assembly, because a lot of what we do in fact, unfortunately, 80 to 90% of what we do every year is try to get out and knock out bad legislation that would certainly tie the hands of our clientele in our industry. And you would not believe what we see every year. Um, and we didn't think that there was that notion of there ought to be a law really came into play, but we assumed it was. But we were proven it, it was proven to us this time, this last legislative session. Uh, in the form of a bill that actually got passed by both houses. And it didn't involve anything up here, but it was in Spotsylvania. And there was a bill, and I gotta lay out the, the groundwork here, two associations, a parkway running in between the two associations. Associations by agreement, recorded, had the obligation to split the costs for the maintenance of that parkway. The, the median, the entranceways, and the, and the right of way uh, grass and, and flora and fauna that's all, all along there. Well, this legislator got wind that there are a couple of owners in these associations that didn't like the fact that their associations were paying for this and they think the state should pay for all that. And so this legislator said, okay, if, these, uh, if this contract is not terminated, it was legislation, if this contract is not terminated by 2019, it will be deemed terminated and VDOT will take over the maintenance of this parkway. Now think about it, if you have a parkway running through your community that you've been taking care of and it's beautiful, and then you turn it over, and forgive me, I, I have friends who work for VDOT, but think about VDOT taking care of maintaining that parkway. I mean, they're just gonna roll, roll over it. And the folks did not like that. The, the, the majority, and, and the strong majority of people in each of the communities they thought when this bill came through, it went under the no noses and under the radar of everybody, even us. It got passed in the House and in the Senate. And 
we looked at it and somebody said, one of, my, one of our uh, folks that we know down in one of these communities sent it to us. I said, where did this come from? They said, I don't know, but we're having a town hall meeting with the senator, with the delegate that put this bill through uh, tomorrow night. You want to hear the results? I said, yeah, let me know about it. So what happened was the, the delegate gets up in front of this town hall. There's 200 people in the room, and they are angry. They wanted their association to still take care of this because they knew what would happen if VDOT started taking control of the maintenance of this beautiful parkway in between the two of them. And the legislator's up there, he's sweating, he's backing off, he finally apologizes, and finally, and this is, this is great for y'all, all, all you board members, the boards were there and like, hey, it wasn't us doing this. It was, it was him. And if one of the board members had the wherewithal to ask, how many residents came to you to ask that you put this bill through? And he finally admitted, three out of thousands came to him because they were mad. And he's like, well, I'll put this through. And it went under the radar. And so fortunately, after that meeting, probably within two days, we got notice that the governor vetoed the bill. So it does happen. It doesn't take much. And then we have to deal with it. So during the General Assembly season, if you're called upon to maybe voice or call your legislator <coughs> about a bill, do so. Because uh, it can only help. They want to hear from you. They don't want to hear from us lawyers. So that's the story I'll begin with. And now I'm going to get into the meat of it. Again, tonight I'm just going to be talking about the legislative update from this year's session. And I'm going to throw in some case law and tell you a few stories about it. But first, let's get through the legislation. And if we have time at the end, I'll do some case law. But I certainly want to leave it open uh, for questions. And I want to get you all out of here probably by 8 o'clock. Okay? Does that sound good? Okay. okay. Well, civics lesson this year. The legislature was, the General Assembly session was a short session, which is 45 days. Um, every other year it's 45 days, every other year it's 60 days. They still cram in the same amount of work, it's just they're doing it in a short amount of time. As you can see, there were roughly 2,900 bills that were passed or introduced and 1,700 of them were passed. In our world, we're looking at probably 30 that we're tracking. So getting in front of the legislators and telling them our stories is kind of tough when they're dealing with thousands of bills, but that's what happened. So, what you have before you, and I hope everybody has one. Has everybody come up and gotten one of these? Everybody have one? Yes. Okay. This is our hymnal. This is our statute book. Ken Chadwick likes to call it the hymnal. So, uh, if you get uh, restless and you can't sleep, just open this up. You're going to right to sleep. But this is what we deal with every day. It's tabbed. It has all the requisite uh, or the per uh, pertinent provisions of the Condo Act, the POA Act, the Nonstock Act. Uh, so I see legislation and that kind of thing. These laws that I'm going to talk to you about and these bills will become effective on July 1st. So be mindful of that. Okay, I mentioned the realtors. The realtors, <coughs> again, they get their hands in it, but we're okay with it. They get their hands in our, our business quite a bit and just on something every year. This year there were three particular items of concern for the realtors. One, for sale signs. Two, acknowledging that realtors um, who represent owners, particularly maybe owners who are investor owners or that kind of thing, should be recognized by associations as having the authority of that owner. And three, timeliness of disclosure packets when they're requested. Let's start first with the for sale signs. Um, new legislation, new law. Condo, this applies to condos and POAs. Unless expressly authorized in the condominium, condominium instruments or in the um, recorded declaration, Associations cannot mandate their own for sale sign or require or restrict for sale signs to a point that they are not in compliance with the Virginia Real Estate Board requirements for sale, for, for sale signs. What does that mean? Well, I'll tell you. Um, <clears throat> we didn't know when this came up, what does the VREB, the Virginia Real Estate Board, require for signs? Because they're saying, hey, here's the problem, here's the dilemma. You association are requiring us to put up signs that have a certain character, but they're not in compliance with our own licensing body's requirements. So we're stuck. So they, but what we said, well, what are those requirements? And it took us a while to figure it out. Really, it's their requirements are that the sign clearly state the name and the phone number of the realtor, and that's it. Okay? So, and so 
you can still obviously limit in common area property or common element, you can limit the signs and, and regulate them. Um, you can also put forth uh, regulations for the amount of time and placement and that kind of thing. You just can't prohibit it. Um, be mindful of the, the fact that uh, if look at your covenants, if you have signed limitations that are expressed in your recorded covenants or recorded condominium instruments, this will apply to you. So if you have those restrictions in your reported documents, you're good to go. Next, I mentioned that associations cannot require um, an owner to execute a power of attorney to be able to acknowledge the, the authority of a real estate agent for that owner. Now that deals a lot of times with leasing issues and that kind of thing. It does not mean that an owner or a realtor, I should say, can come into a meeting and vote or sign a proxy on behalf of the owner. That's still the owner's call. And you still would probably, if, you, if that is even the case, you probably need a power of attorney recorded. So, be mindful of that. Yeah, with regard to for sale signs, you can certainly uh, prohibit for sale signs in the common elements or the common area, and you can re regulate the number, location, and removal of the for sale signs. Next thing is for uh, disclosure patterns. Timeliness. The realtors are, are were getting antsy and getting complaints about disclosure packets not being provided timely. How many days do you have? To 14. How much? 14. 14, correct. So the realtors went to the legislature and they said, look, we want a little more, we want a little more teeth for the CICB to come in and deal with people who are not timely providing um, uh, resale certificates or disclosure packets. So now, and under, you're, you're all familiar with like the CIC com complaint process, where they complain to the board, the board has to give an adverse decision, all that. This legislation takes all that away and then goes straight to the CICB on a timeliness issue. So make sure you're mindful of that. And, it's, and the CICB now has authority to issue cease and desist orders and, and actually sanction monetarily, I think up to $1,000 for an untimely um, disclosure pack. So, be mindful of that, managers as well, so be careful. Make sure your policies and your procedures are in place to make sure that these disclosure packets are timely. Yes, sir. So, so we'll get a call or an email from a realtor mm -hmm. saying we're closing on Saturday and it's like Thursday evening and we want a disclosure package. And um, clearly they hadn't given it any thought until they realized they couldn't go and sell it. Do we have to break our backs in and run out and get them a disclosure package? I will say the statute requires 14 days. 14 days. 14 days. You don't have to, I, I would suggest not. That's on them. That's on them. And I, I you know, I, we have clients who will, will break their backs and it's okay if you can. Sure, I mean, you know, I wouldn't be just, if you can do it, go ahead. But if, if you well, can't. We do it, it's just that clearly they don't. Right. And it's on them and they you know it, it, it really is it's up to the, the, the agent or the owner to provide the request the written request for a disclosure pack and you're complying if you give it to them within 14 days of the request good question okay here's the one i was talking to you about earlier you know before everybody came in this is a bill that we put forth regard it was pertaining to amending declarations you guys are familiar with your, your declarations. Uh, how many homeowners, how many condo folks do we have here? Any condos? Okay, all HOA, so this will, this will apply to you. HOA declarations. Are you familiar with the amendment processes? They get amended. Yes, ma'am. What's the declaration versus bylaws and articles of incorporation? Declarations, the, good question. The declaration is a set of covenants that is recorded in land records that becomes an encumbrance and is part of the title and chain of title to a lot. Declaration is probably the highest of the authority. The declaration is the one that sets forth the assessment obligation, the charges that an association can charge, what you can and you can't do on a piece of property, and a few other things as well. Um, the bylaws deal with, essentially should deal with, and they're not, they're not normally recorded, but they deal with the running of the association as an entity. And articles of corporation are very much there. If you are incorporated, that also uh, ties into the corporate entity as well. All right, a few more questions. He had his hand up first. Is Sorry. that also called the deed of, of uh, dedication? Yes. Older, yes. Yes, sir. 
deed of dedication, declaration, master deed, a lot of those things are, are called essentially the covenants. Yes, sir. Are there any clusters in wrestling that have a supplementary declaration? I cannot answer that question. Sorry, I just, I don't know. Um, I, that's something that, you know, if you refer to Ken or Will, they'll be happy to answer that. But I can't, I really am not in a position to talk specific to any cluster or the, or the association. But it's a good discussion because now we know what a declaration kind of is, and now, you know, associations do have the authority in the declaration to amend the declaration. Most of them do. And so what happened in 2008, this, this uh, Williamsburg Association, not unlike, you know, associations up here, recorded an amendment to their declaration to limit leasing. <coughs> this was in 2008. If you'll read, and you look in your handles, I'm not going to direct you to it, but take my word for it. There is a provision about amending your covenants. And in the, in the statute, you've got your amendment provisions in your declaration. Usually it's a, you know, HLA, it's either two-thirds, 75%, depending on what your, your documents say. And here, they also require a certificate to be recorded with the amendment to the declaration. And here, the certificate, as if the, in this statute, has, as it has been for years, is that that certificate says that the owners, the requisite majority of owners, the president signs it. I hereby certify, and this is supposed to be recorded with the, the amendment. I hereby certify that the owners approved the amendment, the requisite majority of owners approved the amendment as evidenced by their signatures there too, or signatures to ratification thereof. Okay, just keep that in mind. 2008, this was all in place in 2008, when Powhatan Village HOA recorded the amendment. The certificate to that amendment said, as most certificates do, that the requisite majority of the owners uh, voted to approve the amendment as evidenced by their votes at the meeting um, you know, of more than two-thirds, or at least two-thirds of the owners. And this president signed it and then recorded it. Let's fast forward five years. Tavardics have moved in. They're mad that they can't rent their house because they've already reached the cap on that leasing amendment. You're familiar with the leasing amendment where you can cap it at you know, 20% or something like that. So they decide to challenge it. And what they decide is, they, and it's the first time that any amendment has been challenged, I think, in this, in this manner, was to challenge that the certificate did not say that the owners signed the amendment or ratification thereof. It just says they voted to approve it. And the court, the lower court in Tavardic, it was uh, Williamsburg, James City County, said, oh, no, this, this certificate's fine. I mean, it, 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 it fulfilled the intent. It was, it was certainly record, uh, certainly uh, amended in accordance with, with the declaration provisions because it said two-thirds of the vote, at least two-thirds of the vote. So the purpose of the statute was fulfilled. Well, a year ago, probably almost to the day, it was June of 2016, the Supreme Court handed down a decision that rocked our world. They said, uh-uh, this amendment is not effective because it was not signed. And, the, and actually, the certificate didn't say it was signed. So therefore, this amendment's not effective and it's a Bardic's win. And this amendment has been going on. This amendment has been, has been enforced since 2008. All right, so, are any of you claim to be really familiar with the POA Act? Because POA Act, there's another provision in the POA Act, in, right after the provision talking about the certificate of the amendment. It says, <clears throat> an amendment to a declaration cannot be challenged within, after one year of, its, of it becoming effective. So the association said, wait a second, this is five years later. And the judge and the Justice Kinsey of the, Judge uh, Kelsey, excuse me, of the Virginia Supreme Court said, uh-uh, this amendment never became effective because the certificate wasn't right. You didn't have the magic words. He went on for about 20 pages to say, the certificate didn't have the magic words, so therefore this amendment wasn't effective. So essentially, what he was saying is any amendment that didn't have the magic language was not effective. So think about it. 
decades of amendments that might not say that they were signed in the certificate was now up you know, on the chopping block for anybody who wanted to challenge it because now there was no statute of limitations the one year statute of limitations didn't apply. So we saw this and we're thinking, holy crap, we've got to do something about that. And that's why we got to this legislation. Now, I'm disappointed that I cannot show you the floor debate over this because this was, since his name has been brought up, now Senator Surabell, um essentially said this was a power play, as he has always done, by associations to garner more authority. No, we're trying to essentially stave off a disaster for title insurance, for associations all over the, all over the Commonwealth, having to go back to, in, you know, in perpetuity, backwards on amendments to see if they're all recorded correctly. Not to mention the, the, the legal industry, we're like, oh my gosh, None of us thought, saw this coming. So what are we going to do? Fortunately, this bill came through. And uh, David Bulova, who was up from up here, was the one who championed our cause. The floor debate, and, and well, let me, I'll go, I'll get to the floor debate after that. Here's what you need to know now. You saw what happened with Tavari. So what we've done is this, this statute, we revised the certificate language in here to say that the declaration can provide the alternative requirements or methods for amending the declaration, meaning that if you follow your declaration now, it's good and it's effective, irrespective of what the certificate says. I think you still might need a certificate, but be, and you still might need to word it well, but as long as you don't, as long as you are following your declaration, you can, they can't challenge it on the certificate anymore. Now you're thinking, okay, Jerry, that's great for going forward, what about going back? So we mentioned it, we, we made sure that uh, Elliot Boulevard put into this statute and this legislation that this provision can't be used to challenge any amendment recorded before July 1, 2017. So come July 1, 2017, all the amendments are safe. So we just gotta hold our breath for a few more weeks and we'll be good to go. But I just wanted to give you that hindsight because this is kind of the stuff that we're you know, it could have really affected a lot of, not only in just the community association industry, but title industry in general, because they wouldn't know if uh, amendments were effective or not. Now, we don't have any condo. I asked people um, who were, if there were a condo in here, and there aren't any, but I know for the Condo Act is different. And the only reason I say it's different is in that statute of limitations. And Justice Kelsey actually referenced the Condo Act. He says, unlike the Condo Act, which says, you have one year to challenge it within the date of its recordation, not the date of it becoming effective. There's a difference. So if you have some kind of issue with a condo document or amendment, they can't challenge it after one year because it's recorded. And that's, and he, he acknowledged that. He says, but here it says effective, and it's not effective. So that's something to think about. But just know, I wanted to give you that backstory of what we had to deal with this year, but now know that Amendments are safe, but you just be mindful of how you're still wording the certificates and that kind of thing. So, now, to the floor debate. It was on President's Day. And it was, it was a three hour floor session with about 300 bills. <coughs> three hours to cover 300 bills. This bill took up about 45 minutes to an hour of the three hours and they were coming from all angles. We had legislators who were fighting the cause for us, uh, Tommy Norman from Williamsburg, um, and then there was Scott Sorrell who said, I've got 40 pages that I printed off from Google about how bad associations are, and I could read them all right now. That had nothing to do with this, this bill. Um, at any rate, and then there was uh, Bill Stanley from uh, Smith Mountain Lake, Bedford area, and uh, he just thought that this bill was un-American. I'm not sure what he meant by that, but that was his tagline throughout the whole General Assembly session was, it's un-American. But I think it's more American than most things to allow the, you know, the, the, the will of the people who voted for these amendments to stand. It. And that's what you got. And that's what was intended. But the Supreme Court, Justice Kelsey, he is a, he is a strict constructionist of 
the law and he said he read it narrowly and he said no this says sign and i gotta go with it so hopefully we fix that but i think that's okay disclosure packet notice um here's the thing this is just the obvious they're requiring you know the cicb has to provide a notice of the disclosure packet and one of the delegates had a i guess a constituent who was griping about disclosure packets and finally he just said okay here's what i'm gonna do cicb you got to add another another line to your notice it says um, anyone who has entered into a signed contract it's going to be binding on them that's why i have captain obvious up there <laughs> Okay, Virginia law, fair housing law. Do you guys have pet regulations in your communities at all? Mm -hmm. Well, just be mindful of it because uh, if you come into this situation, I've got three slides on it, but they amended the Virginia fair housing law to deal with assistance animals. And it's probably good, it's a good lesson for everyone. It, it, provides, um, it provides mandates that frankly, if someone was faced with a request for an owner to provide, a, to give them a, an assistance animal or an emotional support animal. Essentially, what they're requiring in the statute is what we would have advised anyway, so it's really nothing that's new. But so you need to be, be mindful of it. Um, and it's the Virginia Fair Housing Act that was amended by this statute. So it, basically, it defined an assistance animal as one that alleviates one or more identified symptoms or effects of a person's disability. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, individually trained or certified. It's not just dogs. I'm aware, you know, emotional support animals I, and, and assistance animals. I know of a case in Michigan, there's a seeing eye miniature horse, believe it or not. Um, emotional support animals can be ferrets. They can be horses. They can be guinea pigs or hamsters. Those are mine. I named them Ken Chadwick in Little Washington. <laughs> I say that every time I present that and they throw stuff at me but know this if you do have a if there is a, a situation where you have deemed some, uh, uh, an animal a service animal or an emotional support animal um, they are no longer deemed a pet for anybody who has pet policies again this may not apply to you guys but it's good maybe pass it on for anybody who's in a condo that has pet rules once they're deemed an assistance animal or an emotional support animal they are no longer a pet they are a tool to help someone deal with their disability. So, weight limits don't apply. Who defines uh, that it's... Uh, yeah, so where do you get to... Uh, next slide, let me get to... Yeah, good, great question. Rights and responsibilities, accommodating assistance animal, animals. animals. All right, one, you can't require a pet fee once you've deemed them to be an assistance animal. Two, um, but if the animal poses a threat or safety, you can certainly regulate against that. But know that you cannot say, just because it's a, a particular breed, you can't have it. Because uh, they, they, the Fair Housing Act says, no, they, you, know, you have a chihuahua that's a beast, and maybe a pit bull that's a sweetheart, but they're both emotional sport animals, and if one is a danger, you can't gauge it just solely on breed. Now, I think this answers your question. Uh, right to responsibility, documentation can come. What it is you need to, what as an association you can request if it's an emotional support animal. If it's obvious, the disability is obvious and the animal is necessary, you can't ask any questions and don't. If someone's clearly blind and they got a seeing eye dog, there's no need to ask. Typically it's in the emotional support uh, arena where you, know, you don't see, there's no visible sign of a disability. And so that's where you need to ask but don't ask too much. Ask them to provide some support um, from, and this is where we get to the new law, not just a doctor or a licensed mental health provider, because it used to be that, but now that it can be just about anybody. You know, some peer support group or a reliable third, any reliable third party or government entity. So I'm not sure, haven't gone there yet, so I'm not sure what all would qualify, but it is a pretty wide swath of folks who know if they're aware of the person's disability can do it. If you get that situation, contact counsel is all I can say. Yes, sir. So basically, my pet is a emotional, is a support animal. Mm -hmm. If I deem it to be such, 
and persuade one of my friends to say yes it is I agree I'm not willing to go that far not just yet but as it says a reliable third party we don't know what that means yet I would think it would be maybe a little more than a friend I'm thinking we've usually had if you had a therapist or somebody that would deem that it's you, you might need to get you know you give give that person the opportunity to have that dog um, I'm not willing to go that far personally um, and I'm all for fair housing and that kind of thing but you know I've dealt with dozens of occasions where people have said well you know here I have an emotional support animal and they paid the hundred dollars and got a certificate online that doesn't go well well my my only point is that i agree that it's ludicrous to go that far but i think that language is broad enough to permit it. well and it might be it hasn't been tested yet it's a good point um i think um uh, you know there has to be some kind of reliability in that that person when we deal with a reliability standpoint, if it's just your friend, can are they are they authorized or licensed or qualified to say this dog Ted helps this person get through the day and they need this per and they they have this type of disability an emotional disability and this dog alleviates that. There are times and circumstances where you could maybe refute it, and we've done that. Well, we're aware of it being done where the person wants an emotional support animal in their condominium and you get to trial and like okay and we need it there stays there and the, 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 the uh, person is on the stand saying yeah I keep it doesn't bark in the day I keep it in the you know I have somebody let him out during the day and we're like wait 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 you don't take him to work and the judge we're aware of the judge throwing that out because it, apparently that person didn't need it when, when, when that person went to work and the judge is like hmm you know it will depend on the circumstances, I, I think. And I'm just not willing to say that if you've got your neighbor or friend to go in and write a letter and say, hey, I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the neighbor. I just, I don't know, but it's a good point. It just might. Of course, just the opposite is true. If an animal depends on a human as a support human, that's a little Yeah, so I, would, I just refer to one of our newer associates in the Richmond office. Andrew Elmore is the, the my partner in the Richmond office, and, and we have a new a newer associate named Mike. And I said, "You're you're Andrew's emotional support animal right now." <laughs> he was very he took that with pride. Okay, do the dams. Uh, there was a legislation out. This probably is not very applicable, but the the, the good thing about dams is that. Uh, and the legislation this year is that the director of, uh, Virginia, of the Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation, um, last year they were authorized to provide loans to owners of dams. Uh, and that included private entities like associations who were maintaining that common area dams and were maintaining dams and they needed the funding to do it. This year they've added not just loans but grants. So if you know anybody who has an association that has to deal with dams, it's, good, dams. it's good news. Dam, what's that? We have dams. We yeah. have at least uh, how many? Maybe. Yeah. So there you go. I mean, I mean no. We have the, we have, oh, we have three ponds and, uh, and and basically you were thrown on top of a hill. So if you don't have the dams, it is water just goes down. Right. The hill. So there you go. So if if it is applicable, now if you the thing is with the grant uh, funding, there has to be a report done to show that there's money that needs to be spent to maintain. Excuse me. <coughs> just a curiosity. So, because we're on top of the hill, there's, there's a possibility that someday the water will get through the barriers we have to keep them in, in, as ponds. Mm -hmm. and, and then that water being the way it is, it will work its way under basically one of the dams. So they can give us a grant to fix our pond. The whole well, if it qualifies, and I, and I don't know what the qualifications are, but it's worth a discussion. Well, I'll tell you, that would take a load off our lines. Because that's <laughs> well, I can't, yeah, I can't tell you if it will or not, but it might be worth a, an investigation. And uh, you, you know, I invite you to pick up the phone and talk with the folks at the Virginia Department of Conservation. No. Do legislation, because now it's not just a loan, it's a grant. Yeah, I really like that, that grant. So well, if we could just get the oyster beds to work, it'd be a business. <laughs> well, we'll fast forward to oyster beds, why don't we? There we go. 
But anyway, I'm gonna, you know, I'll just talk about it since I have this up. Basically, they amended the notice, and this is all for a lot of our clients that are in the Tidewater region and on the Bay, is that the notice provisions for someone who wants to, uh, uh, app, who has applied to the state for uh, 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 assignment or leasing of an oyster bed, notice, it's a deal with notice, they notify um, by register served by mail owners within 200 feet of the selected grounds, but also here's the thing that happened that, that pertains to us is that providing notice to the association's board is enough to provide notice to all the owners in the association. So the, if you have friends who are on the boards of associations that are budding waters where and they get a notice like this, they probably ought to let all of their owners know somehow because that's that's going to be the case. So. All right, you mentioned orders, oysters, so I went there. So I gotta go back to short-term leasing. Airbnb bill. This one came up, I think our, well, the Republican candidate for Lieutenant Governor, uh, uh, Jill Vogel, put this up last year. And just to recognize Airbnb as a uh, entity, to be able to just recognize their authority to, to operate in Virginia. And the storm of um, anger that came out of this that bill she didn't it, it blew her away she said i just really just wanted the bill to recognize airbnb and then everybody jumped on and i can tell you who jumped on the, the quickest and the strongest was the, probably the most the, the most powerful republican in the um senate is tommy norman and where's tommy norman from anybody want to take a guess i mentioned it just a little while ago williamsburg williamsburg james county what are there a lot of in Williamsburg? Hotels, yeah. beds and breakfasts. There's, and he said, wait a second, you're gonna let Airbnb just handle this, be this platform for people renting out, you know, short-term weekend rentals and that kind of thing, and they're not gonna pay taxes? Like our ho my hotels and my beds and breakfasts all around Williamsburg? He, th he thought, no, that's, that's, that's not gonna happen. Um, Fast forward through the summer, the Virginia Housing Commission, which I, I serve on two of their work groups, um, they had hearings on Airbnb, and the national marketing uh, president for Airbnb came to those meetings, and it was their legislative meetings in the Capitol. And this, I felt sorry for this young lady who was the head of marketing for all of Airbnb. They grilled her because there was no, people were, you know, those representing the localities were really upset because localities were out of it. They couldn't. They couldn't regulate it. Um, the hotel industry was upset. The bed and breakfast industry was upset. And there's, I can't remember how many groups came out of the woodwork that represent hotels, but it was uh, it was quite contentious for a while. But came out of it finally. Tommy Norman's bill finally came through, and he kind of watered it down a little bit. But it basically, it's in the in the uh, statute the Virginia code under the ABC licensure requirements, but it basically says you need an ABC license if you're gonna offer short-term rentals. And also, what's more important is that bill now authorizes localities to require registries, registration of anyone who is uh, offering up short-term, and not just Airbnb, but anybody who's doing short-term leasing of their property or their unit in a condo, they need, it, this allows, it, it doesn't mean that they have to register with the locality. This authorizes the locality to provide the requirements. And it gives more power to the localities to regulate Airbnb in the manner that they see fit. Now, the good thing for this about this for us is that <coughs> if an association, excuse me, if an association has in their covenants regulations, prohibitions of any kind for short-term leasing, this doesn't affect it at all. We made sure that was in there. If there's authority for the association to limit short-term leasing, none of this statute, whatever the, the, life, the local government does, you can still enforce your covenants against short-term leasing. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, so I still fully don't understand that. If somebody, well, if an owner, how owner in my cluster wants to turn it into an Airbnb, what is required and? Well, I, I would, defer to the documents, and I can't answer that question without deferring to the documents that are applicable to your cluster. Um, if the locality has regulated it, um, they would need to, you know, if the locality has followed the statute and said, hey, we're gonna require registration of Airbnb and, and, and a fee, 
if they haven't done that and you're aware of it, you can certainly call the county or the, the locality and see if they're going to do anything about it. But again, that's different from what your covenants would say or your, your uh, applicable uh, documents. The point, of, the point I'm making for us is that it doesn't affect our ability to regulate in, uh, in accordance with our internal documents. Does that make sense? Well, we can talk later. You know, so. That, folks, is my legislative update. Um, we've got about 20 minutes. I've got a couple cases that might be a couple war stories if you want to hear. Would that be good? We'll get out of here. Okay. Are we talking about oysters? Okay. Case law trench. You've seen the movie Christmas Vacation? No? Okay. That's why I didn't put the full wording on here because it's kind of um, <laughs> inappropriate. But anyway. This is a case, and this is a Virginia case, but just remember, we have a whole case law when we do our seminars. We have an outline in our seminar book that has probably 10 to 12, 13 cases around the country, and that's what we put forth here. Um, you know, our clients always say, hey, you know, Jerry, you know, we do this, we do this, we're not going to sue. You yeah, know, we never, we're never going to be in, in part of a lawsuit or at any stretch of the matter. Any, by any stretch, and I'm thinking, well, it could happen. And these are, this is why we put these cases out there, because that we see them, we get a weekly update on the case law around the country that affects community association. And there's a lot of them. And frankly, it, it, is, it is a lesson for everybody in this room and whoever's a, a community leader to make sure that you are doing things the right way and abiding by your covenants. But these are some of the ones that kind of provide some insight as to what you do. The cases, the three cases I'm going to talk about real quick are not Virginia cases, so they're not binding on Virginia, but they offer up some at least uh, guidance as to how you should, you know, handle your business. With regard to the, uh, the Weimer case, this is the Weimer against Cook, this happened in Wyoming. Now, in this uh, subdivision, I would call it, uh, this neighborhood in Wyoming, neighborhoods, little bigger few parcels of property there, but uh, um, this was actually a case between two owners and the covenants and one was trying to enforce the covenants against the other. The covenant said that you cannot sell a parcel that's less than 20 acres and also it said that you cannot, it, it, that each parcel required a detached single family dwelling, a detached garage and a barn and a stable or a shed on each parcel and that's all you could have on the Well this gentleman bought a piece of property was 20 acres and he decided to divide it uh, into four acre parcels one for him and the other four for RVs he was gonna make he was gonna divide up and say he's gonna have storage spots for four RVs and, and so the complaining owner said no you can't do that because it says one detached well one single family detached dwelling in a garage and a barn that's all you're allowed to have well the owner that was putting wanting to put the RVs in there said wait a second you allowed your family to stay for like three months in an RV on your lot. And then they left, and then you allowed like two others to come and, and park a trailer on your lot for another six months. And they told the judge, I said, what has happened here is that these covenants that require single family detached and just a garage have been waived. Basically, he says that in, in um, well, he said that they've been abandoned, the, the covenants have been abandoned. And what has to happen, at least in Wyoming, for an abandonment is that the restriction has to be radically and permanently changed in the neighborhood. Okay, so the owner who wants four RV units on his property says, well, this guy did it a couple times. Do you think that's a radical change in the neighborhood? No. So that's what the court said. The court said, now we're going to just go ahead and you know, it's not a radical change. You can still enforce that covenant. You need to keep those RVs away. Next case, architectural guidelines. When you're dealing with architectural issues, this is a case out of Indiana, and it dealt with, um, uh, what was it? Uh, it was cedar siding. That's what it was. So what happened was the architectural covenant, or the, the covenants talk about architectural design in the actual architectural review committee. How, what standards did the architectural review committee have 
to determine whether someone could put cedar, side, cedar siding on or something different. Well, the architectural committee's standard, according to the covenants and their rules, was suitability uh, with the surrounding homes to ensure an attractive, harmonious development with continuing appeal. <coughs> that was it. What was unwritten was that the architectural review committee did not like vinyl siding or aluminum siding. Well, this owner, Garadenko, had cedar siding, which was approved when it was okay, but they were, it was getting eaten up with bugs and termites, and they had to replace it. So they put it up, they put up uh, vinyl siding that looked like cedar siding. But the association realized it was vinyl siding, and so they sued, and they said, hey, you can't have it because it's vinyl. And so what the court did, though, was noted that um, in that case, that, and of course, this person, I think even the Garadanko knew that they were, that the, you know, there was an unwritten rule that they didn't like cedar, I mean, didn't like uh, vinyl siding. He said, well, I'm gonna put a vinyl anyway. Because you know, owners who are violators, they don't ask for permission, they'd rather ask for forgiveness. You know? They usually do it and they say, hey, forgive me. So he put it, they put it on, the, the association and said, you know what? You need at least, you didn't get approval. First thing, because that was a requirement, you need architectural approval anyway. So submit an application. And I think every association should do that. I think if somebody's putting it on, at least say, do you have it for your record? Even if you think it's, yeah, this is gonna be fine, tell them to submit it so you have, you know, you have record that they've submitted the application. And it, you know, certainly helps uh, beef up the record for the corporate entity. <clears throat> but they had them submit the application for the vinyl siding and they didn't, then they denied it and they wanted him to take it down. And uh, the, uh, the circuit court agreed. They said, yeah, you have to take it down. Well, he appealed it, the appellate court said, wait a second. Um, the association, one thing the appellate court said, one, you didn't have a hearing. I think they required a hearing when they submitted the uh, application. They just, uh, the sex parte, they just went ahead and, and denied it without a hearing. And then they made him take it down. But also the Supreme Court also uh, in uh, Indiana also said that the association um, had no evidence that the owner's new siding had a negative effect on the property values or that it was not harmonious and that no one in the ARC had any real estate experience. But what was clearly the big ticket item for the court was that there was no written rule. This was, there was, there was no notice of any, to, no written notice to anyone in the community that they were limiting it, they were, excuse me, they, were, they would deny aluminum and vinyl siding. So the important lesson for here is you know, make sure you get as much in writing as you can with regard to <coughs> rules and regulations. Yes, sir? You know, uh, rest of the is pretty unique this way because something like that would have to go through the rest of the design review board. Right. And then they would look at your community standards. Yeah. So uh, if your community standards said cedar siding. Yeah. There's no way that that would fly. Right, exactly. Okay. That's the lesson if you and, have it. I mean, the obviously. The DRB handles the hearing and all that. Right. So they, they should be giving us all top cover for enforcing community standards. Right, I, I agree. I mean, if, if you have the community standard there and it's, and it's written and it's been provided to the owners and they're on notice, unlike this case where it wasn't, it was just a kind of an unwritten rule. It certainly, they still had approval authority, but it didn't. And it just said su suitable and harmonious with surrounding structures. Yes. The court here said, you know, you need a little more than that to say you can't have vinyl. So that's that's a lesson learned. Yes, ma'am. Um, small point, but the DRB doesn't have to follow your standards. I'm sorry? The DRB doesn't have to follow your standards. Okay, with well, this look, I mean, you're talking about the terms. Okay, yes, sir. Again, my caveat at the beginning. Whatever your documents say, I don't know. But anyway, go ahead. Well, I'm gonna say right now it's kind of interesting that so many different materials are showing up. For instance, uh, we basically in our place have kind of like a plywood that we put on the side, but there's a, a synthetic party panel that doesn't look exactly like it, but it kind of does. Right. And Reston approves that. If you want to change your entire house to that, they'll let you do it. So that's a situation where a new material I guess showed up that mm -hmm. looked kind of like the old ones and they said yeah why not and then you get to this this business with like Tesla or whatever who's going to have these tiles that, that are basically 
solar that are going to look like regular tiles, I guess. I don't know, I haven't seen one. But, well, that's, yeah. But it just sounds like there's a lot of materials and things coming up now that, that covenants and all that were written 15 mm -hmm. years ago, 30 years ago. Right. It kind of may not make any sense anymore. For oh, and, and that's, a, that's a very good point. And that, I think that happens more often than you think around the country with you know, certain things. And um, frankly, uh, you know, if that is the case, and we've always advised clients, and not necessarily specific to Reston, but if they're, you know, sometimes you're going to need to change with the times. Sometimes, and we do have, you know, covenants that will say a specific side type of, like uh, in Richmond, we have some old communities that say you have to have the uh, cedar shaped roofs. And gosh, Richmond is not the place to have cedar shaped roofs. They look great, but they'll go, they'll, they'll just deteriorate real quick in the humidity. But um, what do you do about that? Well, I think probably is the best way is to amend your covenants. And you shouldn't, we, we've, we've been pretty successful at that because you, if you pitch it that way, it's like, okay, so all you owners who, who don't want this covenant to be amended, when you go to uh, get your roof replaced, we're making you put cedar shade back on. And that's an expensive proposition. But if there's other types of roofs now that look good and that kind of thing. But we also have had that issue with solar panels generally. I mean, back in the day when the solar panel legislation, I think one of our tabs, yeah, one of our tabs actually has solar panel. Solar collection. Solar Was it because solar energy collection devices? Wait, Excuse me. You can't really stop people nowadays from putting solar panels on the roof of their house, I believe. But when yeah. they have solar panels that look like tiles, can you now stop them from putting anything but tile looking solar panels? Well, here's the thing, and, and I, we could get into this. I could do a whole presentation on solar panels, but you're right. Solar panels and solar tiles and whatever are starting to look more like you can't see. I mean, back in the day when we first started debating this, the argument was like, well, anybody can put a bathtub and line it with aluminum foil and throw it on top of the roof here like this. You know, but now, you know, the industry is becoming more and more, you know, solar panel industry, you don't see it. But there are covenants out there that still restrict solar panels and if you, you know, you gotta be careful, um, particularly, I mean, solar panels typically will, um, you know, so if, they, if they have to face a certain way, you may have a whole street of homes with solar panels on the front face of their roof. And I don't know if that's something you want. Again, I'm not a solar panel expert. I know that they're becoming more and more visible looking, but you know, you, you, it's still out there, the ability to enforce, but you gotta look at your documents. And then, then so, yes ma'am? What's a covenant versus a standard? Covenant, well, that's a good question. It goes back with the, what's the difference between declaration, bylaws, and articles. Um, there's one other uh, avenue of authority, and that's your rules and regulations, which would include your standards, policies, resolutions. Typically standards, and again, I don't know how Reston is set up, but in the grand scheme of things, the standards are what are rules and regulations, essentially, or, or architectural standards that are unilaterally adopted either by the ARC or the board um, to supplement the declaration. Like for instance, if you have an ARC provision in your declaration in the, in the Architectural Review Committee, it shall be consists of this and then this, this number of people, and they'll have the authority to, um, you know, say what can and can't be put on a lot. And they all, typically you'll see an Architectural Review Committee shall also have the authority to adopt standards and guidelines. And then that's what they do. So it's not, here's the thing, if a standard and guideline, it's a matter of hierarchy because it's just a, a rule that's unilaterally adopted by the board or the architectural committee. It doesn't hold as much power as the declaration itself, meaning if the standard is inconsistent with the declaration, the declaration is going to trump because the declaration covenants, master deed, however you want to call it, condominium instruments, because in a condo, the declaration bylaws articles all have to be recorded and they're all part of the same document, essentially called the condominium instruments. What's recorded is the, the top of the chain. Unless, of course, a statute trumps that. And then the federal government trumps that. <laughs> and think about um, satellite dishes. You, know, you, can't, you can't trump satellite dishes. So uh, the regulations for the government. Um, does that answer your question? The standards are kind of a little bit further down. But they do offer, they're, they're enforceable. 
because it, particularly if you have authority to adopt pursuant to the act or pursuant to the doc or pursuant to the recording covenants typically a recording covenants authorizes the board to adopt rules and regulations and standards in the method by which it's so covenants would include something like um, uh, bylaws no. no no what's that I, I mean the covenants right now we have is the you know, restaurant association yeah so the covenants so do covenants are typically tell you one it establishes the charges and assessments it defines what's unit what's I mean, what's lot what's common element uh, common area excuse me it uh, i know reston's a well, different sure. creature it's a different creature but yeah, i'm just talking to typically uh covenants talk about what you can and can't do on your lot but also probably authorize the association to adopt rules and regulations not inconsistent with them as to how to clarify or supplement those restrictions um those types of things so it's it's and that's why you need the requisite majority to amend the covenants in order and to record them correctly and thank gosh we've gotten rid of tabardic but be able to record amendments to the covenants that require the, the covenants see here's the other thing rules and regulations and standards probably are unilaterally adopted by the board don't, don't require a vote of membership i'm not familiar with reston i know there's some that require ownership approval but for the most part a rule regulation standard a design guideline usually is adopted by the board unilaterally when you're dealing with covenants it's a heavier weight and if you want to amend those and adopt those you're going to need a vote of the membership that's how that works yes ma'am yes i just wanted to make people aware of the this is the Western association governing documents yes want to do and um, the individual I guess my understanding and in trying to understand you is you know this is the law so to speak mm -hmm. this is the enforcement of our individual uh, I guess I'll say um, cluster uh, bylaws if you will or their standards so this right. is the enforcement I guess that's the wrong word but yes. they the um, it gives them the power to enforce the standards that are Article 7 of the Reston Declaration, also called the Deed of Dedication, also referred to as the Covenants, mm -hmm. has several names that apply to it. Mm -hmm. Article 7 acts really as a declaration for the clusters. Uh, I asked earlier, are there any clusters that actually have a supplementary declaration? No, we don't know. I'm not. None that I know of. My disclaimer is I am not in a position to answer that question. I'm sure Ken Chadwick were up here, he could probably do that. I do know generally that there are cluster associations, I think, in resident that rely on the master covenants to, for enforcement, but I'm not. I, that's as far as I'm going to go. Uh, without looking at those documents, I couldn't answer that question. So, um, last case animals and pets. A lot of cases out from the Midwest and the West. This is out of New Mexico. El Dorado Community Improvement Associations against Billings. There were several owners in El Dorado Community Association that decided they wanted to own chickens. And so, lots of chickens running around. They didn't use them for, uh, they didn't use them uh, to slaughter and have, you know, roast chicken and that kind of thing. They kind of used them for eggs. And that kind of thing but here's the provision of the covenants that were applicable in El Dorado no animals birds or poultry shall be kept or maintained on any lot except recognized household pets which may be kept thereon in reasonable numbers as pets for the pleasure and use of the occupants but not for any commercial use or purpose in this case everyone agreed that the number was not an issue and they were not being used for a commercial purpose how do you think the court came down when people started having you know, chickens running around? I'll read it to you again. I should have probably put it up there. No animals, birds, or poultry shall be kept or maintained on any lot, except recognized household pets, which may be kept thereon in reasonable numbers as pets for the pleasure and the use of the occupants, but not for any commercial purpose. So what do you think the court did? 
chickens. What's that? Could they, did they say they could have chickens or no? Yeah. Who says they could have? Who says the court said they could have? Who says no? Yeah. The eyes have it, believe it or not. The court found that uh, um, the court found that this provision was ambiguous. Ambiguous. They are a bird. They're an animal, and they're poultry. But they're also were recognized as a household pet. The association said, "But wait, they're they're eating their eggs. And they're using their eggs in, in, in that kind of thing." And the judge said, "You know what? They could still be treated as household pets, and still they can use uh, other. They can have other utility." Well, in Texas, they were pets, but we would eat them. I know, but my wife. <laughs> My wife's from New Mexico, and she kept chickens as a kid. Now, this is I have, this is a rooster, and she had a big red rooster that day. And uh, who, who just last night I was talking to her about. She said when she was about that age, the rooster attacked her, and they had it for dinner that night. <laughs> <laughs> they are resistance animals. Now, yeah, you know what? Now, that brings up an interesting scenario. <laughs> well, if it's if it's a uh, uh, hindrance to safety. Then you can you can you can keep it out of there like like a like a vicious dog, right. or something like that. So, but th this is the lesson: is that you know, try not to be ambiguous, ambiguous with what you say people can and can't do, because they said, hey, you can't have birds, animals, or poultry. But they also said, except except for household pets, recognize household pets. And of course, out there in New Mexico, like you say. What's a recognized household pet? And so many people had chickens running around. They weren't they weren't using them for commercial purposes. So, so like my wife said, when she was a kid, she'd go to school and sell her eggs. Yeah. yeah, chickens now, cows next, what steer and yeah, exactly. So anyway, it's eight o'clock, a little after. Um, I'll open up for any further questions. It was good that we had questions during the course of it. It, it, it I appreciate and I applaud you guys for doing this. And thank you for your time and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.